All right, all, welcome back. Uh, this is going to be Microeconomics Chapter 17. And this will be a pretty short one. Uh, we're going to be talking about financial markets, but a lot of this stuff is just, it's going to take reading the book. Um, you know, I, I can't just sit here and read out a bunch of definitions to you, and that's most of what this chapter is. So I'll, I'll give you a brief overview, um, but uh, for this chapter, honestly, most of it's going to be um, you just simply sitting down and reading the book and getting used to the terminology, okay? All right. <clears throat> so I will post the notes in the file section on Canvas, uh, like always. It will be Chapter 17, Micro. Uh, so if you want to pause me and go find the notes after you've read the chapter, um, feel free, and then we'll dive in. All right. Chapter 17, uh, and then uh, section 17.1, how businesses raise financial capital. All right. So there's four stages. There's four categories of ways that businesses can raise capital. All right. And remember, on this side, we're going to be talking about the demand side of, of the capital equation, right? Businesses need capital to grow, to invest, to buy equipment, to pay wages, all of these sorts of things, right? And so the supply side is actually going to be the depositors, for the most part, in banks. That's you and I, the people who just put their money in the bank in a savings or checking or whatever every day uh, or buy CDs or these sorts of things, right? Um, but this, this first section is going to be all about the demand for capital, okay? So uh, firms can raise capital in four different ways. Um, the first is early stage investment. This is all about um, the very earliest part of opening up a business, right? And for most, this means entrepreneurship. It means that you're having to dip into your own savings or your own bank account where you're going to your private banker and saying, look, I need $40,000 of, of capital, which is a very small amount if you really think about it. Um, but for most businesses, it's that way. You know, they, they need anywhere from about 50000 to about a quarter million dollars for, uh, for the most part to open a restaurant or a plumbing industry, uh, a plumbing firm, or, you know, maybe a... a um, I, I want to open up an oil chain shop or uh, one of the things that seems to be popping up everywhere these days is these uh, little dollar generals and um, uh, goods for the impoverished. Uh, it seems like the only brand new thing in America anymore these days. So that's a worrying trend that I've noticed. Um, but anyway, uh, for the most part, it's about entrepreneurship. Do I have a small amount of capital and the knowledge from my own career and things like this um, to, to open up a small business? And if not, maybe I go to, maybe I go to my bank um, and they'll provide me with a small piece of capital. There are also what are called uh, angel investors, and this is sort of a new trend, um, especially in major cities where those who are maybe not even wealthy, um, but there are those who want to contribute to local small business, and so they will they will put forward the money themselves for a guarantee of interest, like a bank would. Um, and there are also, there are also, um, there's a new movement of small community owners where everyone in the community will get together and pool resources as investors. So everybody's going to toss in a hundred bucks this month out of the little that, you know, we have extra um, so that we can invest in a new small business for our community, someone that we trust and we know, and we think that will run a good business and who we feel that we can morally support. Um, we will front them the money for say a five or 10 or whatever the percentage ownership stake is. Does that, does that make sense? Um, it's a pretty cool new way of investing that that, that uh, people at the bottom who are very uh, financially illiterate um, because America doesn't really teach these sorts of things in school. Um, it's a way that they're starting to learn that they can take not only a little bit of control over their own economic future, but also the growth of their community um, it's a it's a it's a neat little trend. So uh, I'm interested in seeing what happens with it in the future. But the the, the 
These would be sorts of examples of angel capitals or angel investors where you're not going to necessarily a, a financial institution. Um, it's, it's sort of this new, um, a new trend to be, you know, there's a, there's a lot of push to be morally and ethically and environmentally and locally, communally and, and all sorts of things. And so these are ways that people can, can make, uh, more detailed decisions about where they are spending their money and what sort of things they are supporting in their own community. So, pretty cool. Uh, okay. Um, and then I would also say the last piece of this is a really big piece. And this is venture capitalism that we, we hear about in the news and, and these sorts of things. Venture capitalists are also a bit of a new trend. This really started in the 90s when you saw this giant explosion in tech and uh, the internet because of the DARPA research and that, that sort of stuff, the, the miniaturization of computers, the, the advent and explosion of the access to the internet, all of this sort of stuff um, caused just a... Um, just like sometimes you get an external negative shock that'll leave you in de depression, Bill Clinton got really lucky and got a, uh, an external positive shock that just saw the the economy explode. Wow, we, we invented this incredible thing that the entire planet wants to be a part of, um, and we have just got money flooding in. And this is one of the things I tell people, like, this is why you should be supporting research and development. These sorts of things are what keep you know, you on top as an economy. So, uh, anyway. Um, but venture capitalists get in the game and they say, look, we have billions of dollars we're really bored with and um, we are also not getting enough return on our money of just sinking our billions of dollars into government bonds or you know, cash deposits, which are really low interest bets, right? They, they want bigger bang for their buck. And part of that is what got us in trouble with the collateralized debt obligations, the CDOs of 2007 and 2008 and the housing crash, um, is this, is this need to try and grow billions into trillions, right? I mean, it's just, it's just natural human tendency. Um, and so, Venture capitalist firms step in and say, all right, we want to, what we want to do is we want to diversify the way that we're spending our money and we want to put big, big bucks into new, potentially world changing ideas, right? We want to meet with a thousand new entrepreneurs and inventors and, and these people with just wild ideas. Um, and we want to, feed 200 of the, those ideas <clears throat> with as much uh, capital and technological development and expertise and networking as we can as this group of sort of ultra rich, right? Uh, and so we'll connect you with the people you need to know in the supply chain. We will connect you with the people you need to know in the production chain. We will connect you with the best and brightest software developers and algorithm writers. Uh, and then we will feed you billions of dollars, right? So that maybe we can get this idea off the ground and it turns into an eBay or an Amazon or an Apple and our billions of dollars now just you know, bought us entire continents, basically. So, um, and, and what they do is they just feed as many as they can, and they know that of the vast majority of them are just going to be, are, are going to fail or get snatched up, um, which they'll get a purchase from, um, even when it gets snatched up. Say, say a Twitter pops up, which is really popular. It starts to scare Facebook. Facebook buys it for $300 million to just keep the competition off the market because, uh, the, the antitrust laws in America aren't being enforced. Um, and so, you know, all of those investors just made $300 million on this pretty basic idea that, that they just ramped up off the ground and got kind of, kind of hot. Uh, and so they know that 80 to 90% of these companies are going to fail, but the likelihood is that they're get one. You really just need one whale. Um, and if you get that whale, you know, it'll, it'll set you up for 
the next thousand years, you know, uh, financially at least. And so, um, it's a, it's this new big game that the, that the big boys are playing at the top levels of, of finance. Um, interesting stuff. It's kind of gross. Uh, but it also leads to some really neat developments, um, and some incredible technologies for everyone in society and even globally. Um, and so as much as you say, man, I wish they weren't doing that sort of stuff. Um, you know, it, it, I wonder about the ethics of it, but then you see the economics of it, uh, and the technological research and development money that's being spent and, and the explosion of ideas and data transfers and data collection and all of these different things that are affecting humanity, mostly for the good. Uh, I don't know if Facebook is necessarily for the good. Uh, I think the, the jury's still out on that one, but, um, you know, you see these world changing things and it leads to a lot of profit and, uh, you know, there's, there's good and bad is what I'm saying. I, again, this is the theme of my courses. Like there's a lot of nuance in the world and, and, uh, just, just start thinking about each side of, of how all of this works. All right. Um, we will move to the second way of raising capital. Uh, we are past early stage development. We now have a company that is, is, is at least developed and, and hopefully is flourishing. How do we get capital and sustain capital now? Uh, one is the reinvestment of profits. Um, of course, you need to be reinvesting your profits into either better labor, right, or better equipment, or better production facilities, or better production techniques, or research and development, whatever it is, you should always be making your company so that you can provide a competitive edge, um, hopefully over your competitors, and be making a profit always, because business moves fast in, in today's world. Um, the other part, the problem is though, right, is, is companies aren't always profitable. Um, the, even the laws of supply and demand simply say that you'll always be producing just enough to break even, right? Um, because, because you're only going to supply as much as you can sell at this particular price that, that the people demand, otherwise you're going to have stuff on the shelf. Um, anyway, right, so you come to an equilibrium. Hopefully you're making profits in the good years. Most of the time you're breaking even. Sometimes it's bad. And when it's bad, right, you cannot use profits to reinvest in your company. And your, your company needs reinvestment um, because you need supplies. You need to pay your labor, all of these sorts of things. So in bad times, you, you can't rely on that. So you have the last two. Uh, and one is, is just simply borrowing from a bank or a bond. Uh, and we'll talk about those. Uh, the second is stock sales, and we'll also talk about a bit of that. Um, but again, a lot of this is going to be on you guys to just go through and read the definitions. There's just a lot of definitions in this chapter. You know, that's that's what you get in a basics course. Um, so some of these chapters are just filled with definitions. Um, but stock sales, uh, there's there's two distinctions even to be made inside of stock sales, right? Uh, you can issue stocks as a company, and it is called, when, when you first issue stocks, it is called an initial public offering, an IPO. You are deciding that you are making your company public, and you are offering investors the chance to buy a percentage of your company. Okay? Um, it's not just a loan. It's not anything like that because companies can also issue bonds, which we will talk about, um, which is a different way of raising money. Um, but in, in the case of stocks, the stockholder owns a piece of that corporation. And generally, if you own enough of a piece of a corporation, usually it's in the company's charter when they go to IPO. Uh, and it's anywhere from 1% to 3%. Um, they'll specify what the number is. But say you buy a half a percent of Apple, you're going to want to expect some say, right? You own one two hundredth of this company. Uh, I want to have some decision-making. 
and especially in smaller companies that need to go IPO, um, if if someone buys up five or ten percent, they will absolutely expect to have some sort of say in what happens in the company, and often that they will basically buy their way into a board seat, um, which is which is how all of that stuff works, you know. But but when you when you buy a stock, but you know, if I buy a stock in Apple, right, I'm not going to get a say. Sometimes they will literally put up a vote on, you know, new company policy, that sort of thing, and you can sort of log in and vote, and they'll weigh everything by, you know, how many stocks do you hold versus the entire corporate 100%, right? Uh, and then they'll balance it out, they'll tally it, and then they'll say, all right, well, well, here's where it came, where we will change the policy or we won't, or whatever it is. Um, but generally, you have to own a pretty good portion of the company to be able to, to, to really have a say in the company, right? Uh, you can't buy one and be like, well, you got to change everything. It doesn't work like that. Uh, you got to be a, a pretty major purchaser. So the, the first sale, the money goes to the business. Uh, and then I hold the stock, which, which just represents a, a portion, a percentage of your company. Uh, and then you'll have to pay me out dividends as you profit, right? But I can sell my stock to another stockholder. Um, and, and I can watch the stock price and say I buy your stock at $200. And now the sales of stocks um, through the IPO and through subsequent sales uh, of the stock have pushed the price up to $300. I would like to sell my one stock. Um, and so I sell it to to purchaser B. I I walk away with a three hundred dollars, um, the original two hundred and the hundred that that the stock increased, and now this individual owns that half percent or whatever of the company, right? Um, and so the original business is not getting the subsequent money from those stock sales. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about how that works. Uh, the company only gets those original stock sales, the IPO. They only get uh, the value from those sales, right? Um, when I buy a house and then I, I resell my house or I buy a car and I resell my car, that money doesn't go back to the car, you know, distributor. Uh, that doesn't make sense, and that's how stocks work, too, okay? All right. All right, basic definitions. I just put this there so you guys can look through all of this stuff. Um, you need to know all those. I'm not going to walk you through the, the basic definitions. 17.2. Uh, yes, we've talked about all of these different things. Um, I'll touch on them. Um, we're going to shift from the demand side to the supply side. Now I'm a depositor. Uh, I want to be able to put my money into some system of growing my money, right? There are lots and lots of options to do that. Um, they are all where I put my money uh, is based on your expected return on investment. What, you know, what's your ROI? What is the risk variance? Uh, is, is, is it likely that I'm going to fall into a, you know, well, it'll, it'll raise by 5%, but there's really only a chance that, you know, the company could drop by 1% over time, that sort of thing. Or is it like boom or bust? <laughs> like this company could just completely go bankrupt next year, uh, or it could turn into a billion dollar industry sort of thing. And that's, that's the, the bet that people are making with like, uh, Netflix and Uber. And a lot of these companies, they have never made a single dollar in profit. They have done nothing but lose money, billions upon billions upon billions of dollars for years and years and years. Um, on the hope that eventually they can turn a profit. But these companies thus far are money pits, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so that's what we're talking about with risk variance. Um, is, it, is it safe? 
Um, or, or is it, is the likelihood swinging wildly between, all right, all right I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a lot of money or we're gonna lose everything kind of thing. Uh, and then we have liquidity. How easy is it for you to, to transfer this investment that you are putting your money into back into capital, uh, or currency that you can spend in the economy? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, for depositors, um, you know, you have a checking account, it's almost no interest. You have a savings account, which is very little interest. You know, these days it's like one and a quarter percent or something. And then you have certificates of deposit. Uh, you can say, all right, bank, here's my $10,000. I promise to leave it in the bank for a year. Um, and if I do that, then I expect, um, you know, a three and a half percent return instead of the, the one and a quarter I'm, I was getting for my, my savings account. Uh, but the, the issue is if, if you do end up needing that, that $10,000, you're in trouble because they're going to take a big old chunk of it. Um, not only are you not going to get your original $10,000 back, um, you're not going to get your interest that you were promised. You're not going to get the original $10,000 back. Uh, and you might pay like a 20% fee. Uh, and, and now you only get eight grand back. Um, so you got to be really careful about those things. Uh, okay. Uh, you can see, uh, if you look at 17.4, this is sort of the history of, of interest rates uh, and the history of savings and deposit rates, right? Uh, and you can you can just see that there's a general trend downward. Uh, and and really, what they did is they started this in 1984, and we're going through a pretty major recession. Paul Volcker decides to kick up the interest rates dramatically, uh, and so it it slows down the economy also dramatically at the time uh, because inflation was going out of control. Uh, and this is really the last time we saw inflationary tendencies was, was around this time, 1984. Um, and Reagan was really pissed off about it, um, be, uh, of course, right? Because for a president, you'd rather have inflation than unemployment. And Volcker basically caused unemployment. He caused, um, you know, the price of mortgages went from, you know, 2% now to 12 or 13%, sometimes 18% was, was the base rate. Uh, and you can imagine, I mean, just like home purchases stopped overnight, this sort of thing. But Volcker did the brave and hard thing uh, and sort of kept things from getting too out of control. So, uh, But since then, it has dropped significantly. Uh, and there's some good and some bad in this, right? The good is that this really helps the economy. It, it helps keep things stimulated. It's really easy to get access to money uh, if you want to buy a house, if you want to invest, um, if you want to do research and development, if you want to buy equipment for your company, all of these sorts of things. Uh, the problem is sort of the moral hazard, right? Um, we're getting to the point where we are at 0% interest and uh, we can no longer reduce the interest rate um, if we go into a recessionary period. And so what we saw is that instead of reducing interest rates like we should probably do as part of the package to get out of a recession under Keynesian economics, uh, what happened is we can no longer do that. Um, and so we're seeing extraordinary unemployment under the COVID virus. Um, and yet we cannot drop our interest rates any further to try to stimulate borrowing, right? Um, and so the only thing that we really could do, I guess, is we could cut taxes, which we did, but that's that's a long-term issue because it, it takes time before people are even filing their taxes. The only thing you can really do is just push money into the system uh, under the neo-Keynesian um, side but but we're missing out on the on the feds entire lever the treasury's entire leverage system uh in the inflation rate because it's at zero right what do we do um we, we've lost an entire economic tool for a macroeconomic system uh and so it's it's kind of uh it's a little worrying. I, I wonder, and, and a lot of Europe is wondering the same thing. Like, where do we go from here? Can we have a sustained negative interest rates where, uh, 
we're paying you to borrow. Um, well, excuse me, you're you're paying us to hold your money, basically. Like it's a it's a really weird thing, um, and we don't know much about sort of what will happen if we start to enter into the negative interest rate zone. Um, some countries have experimented very short term with it, um, but we don't know much about it. So uh, it'll be interesting to see to see what the effects are going to be because some countries will have to adopt these policies. Um, just to get through some economic crises in the near future because, uh, you know, Yellen was recently talking about we might have to set a minimum tax base across the world um, to keep tax dodgers from continually reducing the tax base across the planet. Uh, I think we might have to do the same thing with interest rates, uh, set a minimum interest rate across the planet so that governments aren't all at zero like we are right now um, because of this sort of race to the bottom economically. Um, I don't know, but I have seen it offered quite a few times by, by very um, brilliant and high-level economists uh, at Harvard and Yale and Stanford and other and other schools, so uh, Oxford, etc. Um, so it's something that I know Janet Yellen is considering, and it is something that Angela Merkel and her team are considering in Germany. Uh, pretty pretty neat stuff, um, and it's sort of been quiet talk about everybody signing a pact to to stop the race to the bottom, to stop this sort of destruction of domestic economies, uh, to pull in super rich companies. Um, well, we'll see what happens, right? Okay. Uh, we also have bonds. We're moving from deposits to bonds now. Um, bonds were really popular in the past. Um, I, I, I know that in the 40s and 50s, uh, especially during the war movements, uh, they would sell bonds for the war effort. And grandparents would buy their grandkids uh, bonds, um, not only to support the U.S. government, uh, but also to sort of teach their kids how to save money. And you would have to sit there and, and every year you could tear off your little coupon and you could take it to the bank and you'd say, I'd like my interest payment on my bond. This is a $1,000 bond. It's probably a $100 bond, let's say. I've got a $100 bond on a 10-year maturity. I'm going to tear off my first coupon. I would like you to pay the, you know, say it's... Um, Say it's a 10% repayment rate. Um, I would like you to pay me my $110, right? Um, because you owe me, you know, 10% of the bond's maturity plus the 10%, right? Um, and then you get over the life of the, the bond and you, you take in your last uh, coupon and you get your last $110 um, and you will have you will have gotten 1100 on your original 1000 right? Uh, and so, you know, you can play with the numbers and make it whatever, but that's basically how it works. All right, uh, moving on. The stock market, I'm also going to leave that up to you guys. You guys, uh, it's, I, I guess I would say a few things. The stock market is a really poor indicator of the health of the actual economy. Uh, it's more of a good indicator of CEO projections of future economic conditions, right? Uh, so we're learning a lot more over time um, econo from economic research uh, about what the stock market is. It really doesn't touch much of what Main Street really is and the average laborer. Most people don't really have a whole lot of money in the stock market. Um, or maybe they do, but they have it through, you know, their company retirement fund through some mutual index or something. Uh, it, this is a rich man's game. It's turned out to be um, over time, especially uh, there used to be there used to be more stock involvement by the middle and lower classes. Um, again, in sort of the 50s, 60s, 70s, but uh, they've been pushed out over time. Uh, not, I would say mostly through 
misunderstanding or just lack of understanding. They don't really know how it works. It's intimidating. Um, it's a little bit scary, right, because it is risky. Um, and again, the American education system doesn't talk about financial uh, literacy. There, there's not really, there's very, very, very little financial literacy. Maybe, you know, you spend a day or two on it in some high school course, but um, there, there's a sad paucity of financial literacy. And so everyday Americans are dropping out more and more from the stock market. And it's, it's generally just sort of a top 10% game for, for the super rich these days. So hopefully we can change that. Um, it's been interesting watching the, the new movements on some of these new uh, purchasing platforms and the things that we've seen from GameStop and others. Um, the idea that if you can get enough low-level players to collude, uh, <laughs> which might be illegal by the rules of the stock market, um, then you can shift the game a little bit and you can push back against the big players. Uh, it's it's really fun to watch. I don't know what to think about it. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding because a lot of the people supporting the the GameStop buyers, right, are, are like Elon Musk and some of the other extraordinarily rich people who don't like this other class of rich people. <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's it's a big mess. And uh, uh, I can't wait to learn more. There have been a, con a couple congressional hearings. It's died down like I told you guys it would. Um, but over the next six months to a year, we're going to start learning a lot more uh, as more and more players get into the low-level trading game. So uh, it'll be fun to watch. All right, mutual funds. This is a way that you can buy uh, either stocks or bonds. It's basically a package, right? Um, flow from, from the insurance commercial, right? She's always talking about bundling. This is bundling for investment, all right? Uh, if you want to put together um, a, a diverse package of bonds and stocks and mutual, uh, it, it, the, these sorts of things, then you can buy into mutual funds. Uh, and usually what happens is companies, uh, especially sort of wealth management companies, will put together their all-stars and have their all-stars pick some fund. Um, a lot of times also, you'll just go to your your wealth manager, your investor, or whatever, your stockbroker, you'll say, um, I want to invest in blah, biotechnology. I, I put some, some things here. So th they generally have a theme or a flavor. Uh, the firms have found out that it's a fun way to sell packages to, to investors is like, don't just say it's a diverse way of investing. Say, oh man, you're going to be able to invest in all kinds of logistics companies, right? Or, oh, you love data analysis? Let's put together a data analysis corporate fund um, that you can invest in a diverse number of data analysis uh, corporations, right? And one of the new hot ones is marijuana. Uh, you're seeing, you're seeing big movement in, in the pot firms, not only on sort of the biotech side, the pharmaceutical side, the suppliers, uh, but also like the finance because there's weird laws about these pot companies cannot put their money into banks because of the financial rules um, with the federal government because it's still federally illegal, but it's state legal. And, and so the banks are really scared to touch the money that's flowing through these pot companies because they're afraid the DEA is going to come kick their door in and say, we're confiscating everything, all your assets. Um, and so, again, you know, we talk about where do 
property rights lay and where the rights lay. And we really need a better understanding of how all of this is going to play out legally about where everyone's rights are. You know, <laughs> is it even legal? Uh, it's, it's a really weird game and there's way too much ambiguity in the market. Um, but, but the direction that things are going, I would say, is, is really exciting people. And the, the potential for the market that does exist in the American society and even worldwide, because we're seeing this worldwide. And so you, if you could put together a Marlboro, um, of marijuana, um, then then you could just see the finance opportunities in that as an investor. And so uh, this this is another big uh, mutual fund sort of direction that we've seen lately. Uh, it's these these firms have learned like sell them what's hot, right? Uh, sell them logistics, sell them pot, sell them whatever it is. Um, because it, it it is kind of fun. It's kind of fun to say, hey, you know, I I really think that this corner of the market is going to do well can you please put me together some sort of mutual fund or index for that right um, which i really like the idea because i read the economist all the time and i get ideas about hey we should be investing in that as a family or we should be investing in this as a family and not necessarily one particular company but just sort of that direction because i think there's growth potential there for that industry, right? And so that's what your your financial advisor can help you do with these uh, mutual funds. All right, enough of that. Ba -ba. The last thing, uh, tangible assets. This is going to be housing, which is America's biggest asset. Um, it, it, for Americans, this is a, an enormous, enormous asset. Um, and the, the opening for the chapter talked about the complete collapse of the system and the collapse from an 18 billion mark dollar market and, and almost half of that value in homes gone overnight just because of what people believe homes are worth overnight right uh people stop paying their mortgage um and like <laughs> millions of people stop paying their mortgages and all of those homes are now going to get yanked up and so now there's a glut of home supply on the market and um so none of these houses are actually what we thought they were worth what we thought they were last week. And so you can see where, I mean, just, man, millions of people lost a lot of money. Um, and that's what happens. It just like snap overnight. Well, who, uh, <laughs> everybody was buying this one asset thinking it was worth an incredible amount of money. And then suddenly overnight we realized, well, man, it was a bubble. It popped. Um, and I would say, look back at the stock market, 17.6, we're set to bubble. Uh, we're going to get a pop. We are at like 33,000 right now on the Dow. Uh, and people aren't paying their student loans and the housing market is on fire for no reason while we're in a recession and a pandemic. Uh, there's going to be a pop soon, and so I would say uh, be very careful about pushing your money into the stock market. And uh, I mean, you can just see what the trend is, you know, um, as things peak, and we're seeing like bigger and bigger peaks and bigger and bigger troughs. And you can say you can see here that our peak is insane, and this is only 2017. It has gotten way worse, and so there's a lot of frenzy in the market but i don't know if there's the value to really back it up at the end of the day so uh be careful um all right we're gonna call it there uh you guys have a wonderful day and um i will get more content up soon okay thanks for listening bye